Aloha, this is Jason from Hawaii. Welcome to a special edition of the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. In this episode, I will be interviewing artist Matt Smith. He's, he's promoting his work on Hellboy, Bones of Giants. It is a dark horse four-part limited series celebrating the 20th anniversary of the prose novel that came out on December 5th, 2001. Now, issue two is out in stores already. Issue three will be coming out on January 5th of 2022. And the previous code for that is NOV210286. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me on. <clears throat> no, thank Matt, again, thank you very much. And I just and I just want to let listeners know, you know, before we started the um, interview, you know, I was talking to Matt. I'm going to say it's going to be a fun interview. It is. We're just, and Matt, let's just have fun with this. Okay. Well, we've, we've already looked at like a do-back toy and talked about other things. So it's, it's already off to a good start. <laughs> <laughs> now, Matt, before I start getting into the interview, I just want to, and I just want to go over your background. And like I said, correct me if I'm wrong in any of this. So your, your history, you have worked for some of very well-known um, children's magazines, such as Cricket, Highlights for Children, and Muse. Is that correct? That's right, yes. Okay. And then, now I know you, um, one of your gra earlier graphic novels was Kate DiCamillo's The Tales of Despero graphic novel. Is that correct? That is also correct, yes. Okay. Now I know Publishers, now I've done some research, and Publishers Weekly and the Kirk Kirkus Review gave it very favorable reviews. Also too, Matt has created cover albums and concert posters for Mini Boss. Now Mini Boss, they are a progressive rock band that was originally from Northampton, Massachusetts. Is That's that right. correct? That's right, Western Massachusetts, yep. Okay, and then now I know that, and according to their Wikipedia, they're located now in um, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, Matt was one of the five winners of the 2007 Ain't It Cool News 8-Bit Art Contest. Matt has worked on Barbarian Lord for Clarion Books, and that was in 2014. Lake of Fire from Image in 2016. Folklords from IDW in 2019. Um, Jim Henson's Storytellers, Fairies Number 1. You are the writer and artist for that book from Boom Studios in 2017. And then, correct me if I'm wrong, was this your first work on Hellboy? Hellboy and the BPRD Long Night at Glosky Station, one shot from Dark Horse in 2019. Yes, yep, that was the, that was the, first, the first one, and now uh, returning with Bones of Giants. Okay. Now, Matt, did I miss anything? And do, or do you want to add anything else to that? The only thing I'd say is that uh, Folklords was also from Boom. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I got, thank you very much. But you mentioned things there that I completely forgot about. Uh, so that's, that's, <laughs> that's impressive. I forgot all about the uh, Ain't It Cool News and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, the, you know, I'll just say also that uh, the mini bosses are a lot of fun. If, if they're ever playing near you, they cover all uh, only sort of original run um, NES game uh -huh. themes. So like, you know, the, the, the first three Castlevanias, Metroid, uh, oh, all that. Kind of, Mike Tyson's punch out. All, you know, they, they, you know, they do rock versions. I think there's a lot of bands like this now, or at least uh, yeah, there were quite a few of them at one point. But mm -hmm. I think at the time, the minibuses uh, of Western Massachusetts, at, when I met them, I think they were the only ones doing this. And then mm -hmm. came... Uh, Oh boy, the Neskimos, uh, Power Glove, maybe I forget. There was all these, you know, there, all these other bands came out and were also doing, uh, you know, NES or video game themed rock bands. But you know, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. But I, I think the Mini Bosses were the first, and I'm mm -hmm. totally biased because those guys are really cool. But I also think they're the best. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we you know, continue, before we get into the interview, I want to stop to say, I want to give a big shout out to David Hyde and Hannah Behedry of Superfan Promotions for setting up this interview. David and Hannah, thank you very much. Um, Matt, I'm going to ask you, you want to add anything to that? 
Yeah, no, again, I'll just echo what you said. Uh, thanks so much to David and Hannah. I mean, I haven't had any direct communication with Hannah, but uh, David, I do, you know, going back to the Golosky station, that's the first time I would have had any interaction with him. And he's been just great, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, arranging interviews and that kind of thing. And he's, he's hilarious as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very funny and sweet guy. So uh, yeah, it's been a real, it's been a real treat working with him. Oh, okay. That's great. Now, where can listeners follow you on social media? Okay. Uh, the main one is Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have a website too. I'm pretty bad at maintaining it. Uh, mm -hmm. Matt dash illustrations.com. Every once in a while, I remember to put stuff up there. Um, but Twitter's the main one where I, I'm Barbarian Lord, because I started that at the bequest of the uh, of my publisher. He was, uh -huh. he was saying, you need to get on social media. <laughs> and so I said, okay, what do I do? Um, Instagram, I only got my first smartphone uh, last month. I held out, I resisted it, uh, but I lost my, I lost my flip phone um, on a trip visiting my sister-in-law in Colorado in October. And so I needed to finally get a new phone. And then um, one of my sisters, I have four sisters, my second oldest had an old smartphone. And she's like, here you go. It's mm -hmm. time for you to join the, the modern world. And so I have an Instagram account. I started a while ago. I put a bunch of stuff up there, but I didn't really interact with it because it really is something I think you do with like a, a smartphone, really, right? Yeah. Isn't it? Yes. I think. Yeah. I think there's ways you can do it on a desktop and fool it. Like, I think you can tell it through some setting thing that you're actually a smartphone and you can add stuff to it. But, uh, but um, actually someone, I saw someone online say recently, I think they changed Instagram so that you can post directly from a, a desktop computer now. I'm going to say, I don't know. I'm not an Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> this is a super long and boring answer. Basically oh, no. that, uh, that uh, Instagram um, I have some stuff. I did take some time once, like in an afternoon, put a bunch of stuff up yeah. and then never, never went there again. And every <laughs> once in a while I get, in, I get notices now on my smartphone. I have now saying, you know, so-and-so did something or other. And I'm always like, I should probably look into that because I'm yeah. probably like ignoring friends saying things and then I'm going to come across like a big jerk. Oh. <laughs> so, so, I, so yeah, Twitter is where I'm at most of the time. Uh -huh. uh, and Facebook sort of, but to a less degree. Twitter's Twitter's the main one. Yeah, at some I hear Instagram is 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 the best place to camp out at. So at some point, mm -hmm. now that I've joined the smartphone class, <laughs> yeah. I can uh, you know I can do. I'll just I'll say this about smartphones, and then I'll shut up about it. Um, I did a convention in uh, beginning of November, Rhode Island Comic Con. Oh, okay. And yeah, and so for the first time, I had a smartphone which allowed me to have uh, a square chip reader, you know, the little little credit card reader. Oh, yeah. That, that was great because I didn't, you know, that's been something that's increased more and more, like at conventions. Yes. Uh, I didn't even know what Venmo was, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, square and Venmo and that, you know, I just, I was totally out of the loop. And so having that for the first time i was actually able to say yes for once usually people say do you take this or that yeah i mean mm -hmm. like I, you're speaking some language i don't know so <laughs> no i don't uh oh. but but now i can say yes so that was nice <laughs> that's pretty cool no um matt i mean let me just talk just say briefly because i just joined twitter like last year you know <laughs> so, and i'm having a blast you know just posting pictures of you know when um um i think it was like um you know before the pandemic shut down the conventions you know all the comic book conventions i was able to post you know pictures literally from me you know, because um hawaii has you know at least a handful of conventions down here so yeah. i was able to post some pictures you know on my twitter feed you know literally like from the convention so that was pretty cool that's, that's pretty neat yeah nice <laughs> so all right sorry so let's continue on where did you grow up i grew up in haverhill massachusetts which mm -hmm. is uh right on the border of new hampshire um mm -hmm. haverhill is notable for producing uh rob zombie of the band oh, yeah. Zombie. <laughs> yeah that was uh yep yeah, my art teacher mrs paradis uh also had uh, Rob Zombie, Rob Cummings as a uh, as a student, 
and his brother, uh, Mike Cummings, also known as MC Spider of the band Power Man 5000. So that, that puts Haverhill on the map. We also had Archie Comics uh, started in Haverhill. Mm -hmm. um, and there's probably other things about Haverhill, but uh, actually Haverhill's getting pretty cool. That's the thing interesting now is that there's like a, there's a, this is funny because this ties right into Hellboy Bones of Giants. There's mm -hmm. a, uh, a now a, like a book festival that Mike Golden, who wrote, I mean Mike Golden, I'm mixing things up. Christopher Golden, who wrote uh, Bones of Giants, he runs this book festival at the Haverhill Public Library. And he's had, uh, you know, Joe Hill, Stephen King's son there. Yes. Um, of course, his own books. Uh, Paul Tremblay, who, if you haven't heard of, he wrote several brilliant horror novels. Uh, I, I always take time to recommend Head Full of Ghosts. Head Full of Ghosts, if you like, like, spooky... Uh, I don't want to give too much away. Let's just say it's like a, a scenario where there could be demonic possession or someone could be going through the early stages of schizophrenia and you can't tell where it's going. It's, yes. it's so well written. It's very cool. Um, in fact, <laughs> at the Rhode Island Comic Con, I did, there was a Hellboy panel that I did with Craig Russo, who drew the Young Hellboy series. Uh -huh. And I spent a while just talking about Paul Tremblay. I don't know how I got there, but uh, I'm, I'm going to do it again. Yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, the, the funny thing about it, there is, you wouldn't, it's funny how small things get sometimes, small the world gets. The, there's a Hellboy connection to Paul Tremblay as well. Mm -hmm. After I read Head Full of Ghosts, I read his short story collection, Growing Things, which is a lot of fun. And in there, it wasn't, I don't think it was announced anywhere in the book jacket, there's a Hellboy short story um, oh. by this guy, Paul Tremblay, who lives in Beverly, Massachusetts. I guess he had done it for some kind of Hellboy novel anthology. I don't know. I, don't, I think he did it for something else. And then he found a permanent home for it in this mm -hmm. short story collection. But it's a really fun short Hellboy story and I'm like wondering if he's ever thought of or if anyone's thought of you know translating into a comic because yeah. really, I'm not going to give it away but it's a it's a really neat and completely original idea within the within Hellboy stories not that not that they're not that there aren't a lot of original you know ideas yeah. in Hellboy stories but this I thought it was very cool so uh, there you go okay I'm, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot and I'm, it's an off-the-cuff question so have you talked to Christopher Golden to see if you guys can contact Paul to try to turn it into it? You know, weirdly, I never thought about it. And, uh, and we are supposed to go do what one of Chris's um, book festivals at the Haverhill Public Library, like he offered me to have a table there. I think Paul would have been there. Um, but that was just before COVID, I think. So yeah. I, you know, everything got canceled. But I can imagine if we had had the opportunity to all three of us be hanging out in the same area, maybe it would have come up, you know? Yeah. Uh, Cause, oh yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to take it too far without. <laughs> no, no, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it would be great. Cause it's a really fun story. I could see it, you know, I could see it a, a great comic, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, April has become like, it has a great brew pub downtown. It's uh -huh. got a great record store, which I'm, that's huge for me. Yeah. Uh, so now they have this great record store, they have places to go, they have, uh, you know, this great book festival that Christopher puts on. Um, yeah, it's really, you know, I wish all that was there when I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't we didn't even have a comic book store uh, when, when I grew up. I would have to, I think most of my early comics came from like grocery stores or, you know, maybe department store, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I eventually found uh, a good comic book store up in New Hampshire, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was, you know, it really, aside from Rob Zombie, there just wasn't a lot going on there. <laughs> <laughs> and he moved out. I think he, he split for New York or LA or something as soon as he could. So he wasn't even there when I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do you remember, like, what was your, like, your first comic series or your first comic that you read? Uh, I was given a couple of Tintin books, first okay. thing. That was, and I love that still. Uh, in fact, for Lake of Fire, uh, mm -hmm. Lake of Fire I did with Nathan Fairbain, um, it got a French language translation and we were invited to a, a festival in Belgium. Wow. Uh, and, uh, 
And in the town where the festival was happening was the Hergé, hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, museum. So it's all original Tintin uh, mm -hmm. artwork and all sorts of stuff there. And so that was mind blowing to see the original pages. Uh, but yeah, Tintin was my first and it stuck with me always. And then I became a huge Star Wars fan very early, which we talked about a little bit before the interview. <laughs> um, and so Star Wars comics, that was an immediate, you know, I wanted those. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Thor comics uh, by Walt Simonson. Yes. Um, so that was probably what started my interest in Norse mythology mm -hmm. early on. At least it, it sat there. I didn't immediately, I was a huge fan of Greek mythology as a kid. Yes. Uh, probably in large part due to Clash of the Titans, but also yes. my mom had an amazing book collection. Like I didn't realize it until much later on, like how cool my mom's book collection was. Like I just sort of accepted it. Like it was just like, there's milk in the refrigerator. There's also a bookcase with C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and, and uh, illustrated books on Greek mythology and all this stuff. And so, so, I was heavy duty into Greek mythology as a kid, but I loved the Thor comics by Walt Simonson. I also loved Walt Simonson's uh, Star Wars comics. So I was a big yes. fan of his early on. Um, and uh, and then, so yeah, Star Wars, Thor, a little later on, ElfQuest. I got big into ElfQuest. Uh, yes. And I feel bad for admitting this, but ElfQuest might be the one thing that I haven't revisited since I was a kid. Like everything else I read, you know, as soon as you could get Star Wars and VHS, you know, I bought it so I could watch it. You know, and now, of course, I've seen it one billion times. But, mm -hmm. uh, but like, you know, Tolkien, you know, reread that many times over the years. I think one of the only things from my, like, my childhood that I haven't, like, you know, gone over again and again. I don't know why, because I loved it as a kid. And now I'm like, now it's built up to a thing where it's like, what is it going to be like when, <laughs> when, I, when I revisit ElfQuest? Is it going to be, like, as amazing as when I was a kid or is it going to be, you know, completely different now looking at it as an old, you know, but I, I mentioned this to a couple of people and, and they actually said, no, ElfQuest really holds up. So, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to mm -hmm. checking that out again. So, yeah. And then later on in my teens, I think I had a short run on X-Men, but I won't blow this totally out, you know, take your, bend your question all out of proportion, no, but. No, no, take your time back. I mean, if, if we have, if you have time, that that's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well then, uh, yeah, I didn't really follow stories as much as artists. Like I would find an artist that I really liked and then I would just buy anything yes. that they did, you know, Simonson being a good example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, later on it'd be people like Simon Bisley. I got really into Bisley and I would just, anything that guy would do, I'd, I'd pick it up. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'll be sad if I get his name wrong, but Duncan Fregato, um, you know, who did, uh, he, he worked, he's worked in Hellboy, he did Enigma, he did, uh, oh, he did all sorts of stuff, but uh, he, he uh, he's one of my favorite artists. So I, I would buy, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd go looking for, for artists, because I, I always felt that, that comics were like, um, they're such an inexpensive folio of an artist's work. I was, yeah, I feel like that, that way even now. Sometimes I'll be in a comic book store now, and I'll have no intention of like following the story. This is going to be a total disservice to like writers, but I'll have no intention of like following the series. But I'll just buy this issue. You know, I'll buy like issue three of this series and issue four of this other series, and because each issue is this amazing collection of art. Yes. from this artist, you know, and it, I just can't believe that I can have all of this for however many, you know, $3 or whatever, you know, yeah. and I still, I felt that way as a, as a kid and I still feel that way now. And so sometimes I don't even follow a series. I'm just like, I need this art, you know, and I'm going to pick up this issue, which is right in the middle run, you know, and yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that's, you know, I mean, of course there's stories I get into and follow yeah. the entire series, but I'll, I'll just regularly pick up you know, a stray issue from here or there, just because the art looks great, and I just, I just want to have it. Oh no, I, I understand. Yeah, no, that I understand. Yeah, um, yeah, and like I said, I think for me, probably. Oh, I'm just trying to think. I think like um, the recent thing I could think of is I think when Marvel redid 
when they, re, um, I think they relaunched, what's it, X-Men Forever? But I think that was kind of more of like, you know, it was like three issue story arcs or something. I yeah. didn't buy the fir- I didn't buy the first three issues, and I think it was written. I, I can't remember who it was, but I know I think issue either issue three to six was um, Louise and Walt Simonson, you know, uh-huh. writer and all. Yes. So it's like I just picked that up. I didn't yeah. pick up anything else after that, but yeah, because it's just I remember their work and their especially Walt Simonson's artworks. That guy. His Ragnarok series is my favorite current series going. And I just, you know, how long, like the fact that he, he made one of my first comics, you know, first comics I ever bought as a kid. Yes. And now here I am X amount of years later and, you know, as an old man and, uh, and his Ragnarok series, I think is like, you know, his best work yet, or like, you know, as good as anything he's ever done. And that, <laughs> is crazy inspirational i feel like that you know like his his stuff gets me excited you know in a way that you know you get into any kind of like profession and and uh i'm a huge fan of music right i buy a lot of music and one of the reasons i love music so much is i have no uh relation to it i am not a musician and so it's all like it's all wizardry to me. Like, I really just enjoy it. Like friends of mine will say, oh, you know, the bass is weird on this or the drum sound is off. And I don't hear any of that. I just hear, Mm -hmm. I just respond to the the songwriting. And so I love, you know, finding a a new record shop anywhere I go is like Mm -hmm. priority number one for me. But, um, but so when I was younger, you know, you'd read comics a different way. You're just a huge, you know, huge fan of them. And then, you know, if you get into something as, you know, you can tend to view it as, you know, not necessarily harshly, but you're, you, you get a more of a critical brain, I guess. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, but it's funny with, with, with Simonson's comics, I'm back in kid mode every time. Like, like, I, you know, mm-hmm. not that there'd be anything for me to criticize because they're incredible, but it is that thing where I just want to get in bed with the comic book and uh-huh. like, you know, if it's cold, get a hot chocolate, you know, like it just puts me totally back in that place where I'm just, yeah. you know, it's just, total you know enjoyment and uh and and ragnarok is just yeah it's that classic Mm -hmm. comic experience where and again not that i don't feel this with with other artists that i really enjoy but but it's different yeah i don't know it's um, i'm sure i'm not being very clear but there's there's just a real appreciation for for what he's doing now and back then you know that that he turned me on to thor and this you know the thing is, but but I and correct me if I'm wrong, but it just sounds like it, it you know, because like with me nowadays, you know, and you know, I you know, we're we're both older, is for me it's like, you know, um because I've been there's been periods in my life when I read comics and it's like, oh, this looks weird, oh, this didn't make sense. And but it's but the thing is now it's just in but for me now is it's just enjoy the ride. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah. enjoy just enjoy the ride don't go you know well this part we at this part of the roller coaster we came down too fast you see that thing there that's the switch that made you know that made the flame it's it, it we get too nitpicky yeah yeah for sure all it is is we're just enjoying the ride there that's was the, a i'm a huge fan of twin peaks i don't know uh-huh. did you ever see that show from the no yeah. i'm gonna say no okay <laughs> It's not for everyone. I'm not going to say like, oh man, you need to watch Twin Peaks right away. But uh, it's a very unique series, especially when it when it came out in like 1990 or 89, whenever it came out. Yeah, it was back yeah. Un- unlike anything else that had ever been on television at that point. Yes. And in the, in a new series that came out in 2017, I think. And um, my worry for it was there'd been it had influenced so much modern television. Yes. To be more you know, just to do things that were never done on television before, maybe being more cinematic, maybe being more surreal, you know, everything from Sopranos to Lost. I feel like you talk to any showrunners for these modern shows that are seen as visionary, they'll, they'll name Twin Peaks, you know, David Lynch and Twin Peaks and Mark Frost. Uh, so my concern for the new series, and again, I'm going way off road, was uh, that it could be really interesting 
Mm-hmm. But there's no way that it could stand out in the current landscape the way that the original did. Because the original came out like amongst like Falcon Crest and Dallas. Yes, yeah. <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was no way that like, you know, that this new thing. And that was the amazing thing that the new series did. It was just as out there mm-hmm. amongst all these new shows. I shouldn't have had, I shouldn't have doubted Lynch for a minute. Uh, you know, a lot of people didn't necessarily love the new series as much as the old one, because it it, it, it it sort of went away from some of the quirkier, mm-hmm. funnier elements and was more surreal and dark. Um, whereas the old show was a really nice balance mm-hmm. of, you know, soap opera, quirkiness, you know, uh, silliness, and then extremely surreal, artistic, and dark, you know, and it, it was a really appealing combination of those two things. Um, but uh, I'm going to forget where I'm going with all this. But Lynch, initially, I remember he said, you know, with the new series, he's like, don't sit there week to week and try to solve the mystery. Or, you know, of course, everyone was going to. But he's like, it, he wasn't making a demand. I think he was just appealing to the audience to say, like, just turn it up really loud, sit close to the TV, and just soak it in. And, and exactly what you said, enjoy, take the ride, because it's, it's, you know, it's meant for you to just sort of get absorbed in and, you know, and make your own interpretations from. Uh, and of course, when I watched the series the first time, I, I didn't, re- you know, I totally disobeyed David Lynch. And I was trying to figure out where it was all going and like, when is this uh-huh. going to become clearer? When is, you know, mm-hmm. and then the second time I watched it, I, you know, I really was able to just let, you know, of course, I knew where it was going at that point, but just let go any like, oh, you know, I wish this had been different or whatever, you know, and just like soak it in. And it was very cool to just sort of, you know, take it, take the ride, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, off the cuff question. You mentioned Walt Simonson. Yes. Have you ever met him in person? No, I would love to. I need to shake that guy's hand for a whole number of reasons. Uh, one, turning me on to Norse mythology early on. Um, Two, doing those Star Wars comics I loved. Mm-hmm. Actually, before I get into it, I read something not that long ago that I thought was so great. He did this Star Wars comic back in the day that had giant stormtroopers in it, like, you know, massive, uh, you know, giant sized stormtroopers. And back in the day, when I was a kid, I thought, wow, this is awesome. What's this about? Yeah. I didn't find out until recently. I feel like it was maybe even this year that it was a previous. It was a John Carpenter story. This this Star Wars comic. It was originally penciled out as a uh-huh. John Carpenter story by Carmen Infantino. Yes. And I think they tried to keep. I think it must have been canceled. I'm going to remember this story really piecemeal. But but Walt was to work with what was there and, and reuse as much as possible because they didn't want to waste the work that they had and they yeah. were going to craft a new story out of this abandoned uh-huh. John Carpenter story. And so the the giant stormtroopers were originally Tharks from the uh, <laughs> Carpenters, you know, world, and he just re- reworked them to be stormtroopers. And so uh, I just thought that was so cool, finding that out, that backstory. It was so neat. Um, I, I but, uh, but, but as far as, uh, I haven't met Walt Simonson, but we've had some interaction, uh, even this past week, which has been great. It's just like... Uh, He's, he sent me a really great book on Norse mythology. Um, and I sent him some music that I thought he might like. Uh, nice. And it's just been really nice to have, it's, you know, it's, I, I try not to bother him because that's the thing with, you know, that's the thing now with, the, with Facebook and social media. There's a lot of people you can just reach out yes. and contact. And like, you know, of course, when we grew up, that, that was never the case. You would, yeah. you know, it was, and, and I try to remember, you know, that that, you know, you don't necessarily want to cross that border just because you can't or, or, you know, or bother someone, you know what I mean? Like, yes. you know, it's too easy to just sort of, you, you know, I don't know, just, I just try to be respectful, not that. Uh, and so, but we've had a little bit of back and forth. And then he was also very kind uh, when Barbarian Lord came out. Uh huh. He you know, mentioned it online, like he posted about online, which I didn't send him a copy, that someone else did. Mm-hmm. Um, Dan Brarrington, who uh, did the Nocturnals. Yes. Mm-hmm. Doing the Nocturnals, yeah, he 
that's a whole story in itself. Dan somehow came across me doing Barbarian Lord online, asked me to send him copies. He was then very vocal about how he liked it. He sent it to Walt because they're friends. And mm -hmm. then Walt posted about it online. And that's, I think, how Mignola was aware that I did anything, you know, and this mm -hmm. was years before he asked me to do Golosky Station, but I think that's how I ended up on Mike's radar, was uh -huh. thanks to Walt, which was thanks to Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a really weird serpentine route to, you know, but, uh, but yeah, my friend Craig Russo, again, who I went to school with, which is funny, I went to school with Craig Russo, now he's doing Young Hellboy, and I did the covers to Young Hellboy. Oh, uh, so it was really cool. weird. You know, it's this weird small world thing, yeah. Uh -huh. And we we ended up doing that uh, Hellboy panel together at Rhode Island Comic Con, and that came up. How just what a weird small world it was. But uh, yeah, one day he sent me Craig Russo sent me a message in the morning saying, "Hey, Walt Simonson's online talking about Barbarian Lord," and I said, "What are you talking about?" Uh -huh. And uh, but because I had no idea when Dan Barrington said, "You know, send me some of this Barbarian Lord stuff. I want to I want to share it with friends." I didn't know he, his friends. Yeah, you know, I didn't know he met Walt Simonson. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and uh, so this is a long answer for your question. No, I've never met him, but I owe him a lot. And I would like to tell him in person. And also, I would like him to sign my Ragnarok books. Oh, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have any of my Thor comics as a kid. I have collections now, with, yeah. you know, but, but I wish I held on to my, I have one of my original Tintin books. Okay. Uh, I have like three or four. Somehow one managed to stay with me. Mm -hmm. uh, Cigar of the Pharaohs. Uh, it, it's beat to heck, but I, I love it because it's, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it's the original one that I had as a kid. Um, but uh, yeah, I want to shake his hand, thank him for a whole bunch of things, and have him sign my Ragnarok books. <laughs> but yeah, going back to that Star Wars, the giant stormtroopers, Carmine Infantino, it was like a a John Carter a story that M Marvel produced. Um, John Carter, a short-lived John Carter series. I think it was like 20 issues. I can't remember. In the 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, because that sounds familiar, because I think it turned up as one of the Star Wars annuals. I think that's what they turned it into. Oh, okay. Yeah. I got to get that. You know, now after this, I'm going to have to read up, uh, see how badly I but butchered that story. Oh, but I... But I know that they were, I know it was Tharks who were transformed into stormtroopers. And I think yeah. great. Uh, yeah. But, uh, oh man, those original Star Wars comics. I mean, I was heavy into the, the Simonson one that I had, but also the, the ones that were all. Uh, was the it the uh, Archie had, Goodwin, Carmine Infantino run? Yes. There was one I, in particular that I, for some reason, it stayed in my brain. You know, it's never left my brain. I just loved it so much. It was called something like. Uh, cavern of crawling death or something like was that the stone mites yes i, I, I know I, that, yes <laughs> i love that one first I, of all the the, the the mites are so creepy yeah uh, second you get uh you get uh, maybe your first look at jabba but he's not the jabba we know now he kind of looked like that walrus face they had a walrus yeah. face jabba yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and my brain was like, whoa, as it, you know, just the, the mites and yes. the Java. And uh, that episode was just awesome. And just the, the, the tenseness of hiding out in the cave, you know, hiding from Java and, or yeah. hiding from his thugs or whatever was going on. And, um, and the cover was fantastic to that, like that. And that's one of those, uh, again, I wish I had my original. Yeah. That's one that I need to rebuy. I have in the collection, I know, but I, I, I think I need to have. Uh, you know, if they have like a reprint, or if I can get a, if I can get like a an uh -huh. older copy, I feel like I need to have it in its original form with its yes. cover and, and all that. Because I think part one was yeah, I think the part I think part one, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the cover was there's the Millennium Falcon in a cave and all these critter things are yeah. around it, and of course I think Han says something to Chewie or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I know part two had. And there was a second part where I, it was titled Jawas of Death because there was this huge sand crawler behind them because, um, because I know Luke was with them. I think they are trying to escape oh, Baron Tegan. One of the, yes. He was like a minor character in the movie, but in the comics, they really expanded his role. 
and I know that um, the they hid in a one of the sand crawlers, and I know that that Baron was trying to use. He had some new technology to like freeze things. Yes, yes, that was. A, I thought it had a dewback on the cover. There was one with like a right. loop hiding behind a hill, and there's a dewback kind of like you know that scene in Lord of the Rings, the movie Jackson's Lord of the Rings, where the yeah. hobbits are hiding like along the path and the the the, the Nazgul is like looking it's, around for them and they're yeah. like, that's what that cover was like it's like i feel like luke is like up against like the like a hill or something and he's like hiding out and this dewback is like looking over the edge and the yeah. sand trooper riding him yeah no the new tech i remember this new technology it, it was like it would be these two units and anything in between would freeze right? yes yeah. 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 Oh, and they run it. They run into a frozen bath at one point, which That's I thought. That's right. Was I think yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's just spend the rest of the time talking about this issue because it was amazing. <laughs> no, yeah, but I'll get this out of my system. My other favorite one was uh, Silent Drifting. Do you remember this one? With it, it was like a. I think it. I think this. It actually was the first prequel star wars prequel item or story that ever came out because uh -huh. it was a flashback of a i think it was a scene that opens with you know luke and Leia were flying somewhere and then recounting a story about obi-wan from the past and it was so it was a young obi-wan uh, -huh. uh and he ends up he's on this space cruiser and all this stuff happens um and just like obi-wan being in a different uniform, uh -huh. being out of the, you know, he wasn't the, the old man handing over the sword. He was, yeah. he was still like a gray haired guy in the, in the story, but he was more in his prime. And yeah, this was incredibly cool to me as a kid. And I think yeah. like, I think it really was the first, you know, they, they Marvel explores stuff after yes. the, the first movie in between on its way yeah. to Empire. But I think this was the first time they looked back to mm -hmm. before A New Hope. And in fact, I'm gonna really, uh, test your goodwill here i uh i decided to try to create a custom figure of that obi-wan kenobi i bought a because uh, he's wearing all black so i bought a uh, uh -huh. jedi i bought a jedi luke uh, yes. took off his head and then i bought a uh, a prequel like a ewan mcgregor obi-wan head yes and we put it on and 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 uh, you know, was that on your Twitter? To see this, but this I've been working on that's, this guy. Yeah, so that's it. He was wearing a black uniform, just like this. Of course, no one can see what I'm talking about. But I just need to paint his hair gray. Uh huh. I think I got his costume pretty close. But uh, yeah, that's that's the Obi Wan from Silent Drifting. Oh, but, <laughs> but Matt, I'm going to be I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I don't remember. I'm going to be honest. I don't remember that story because let me explain. Because when I used to get my comics, it was at from a magazine shop, and as a okay. kid, I never knew. I never knew when comics came out, you know, or you know. So sure, yeah. on a Star Wars comic, it was like finding gold. You know, it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, but oh, but I have to tell you, this, I do have the. Uh, omnibuses of the marvel early years the first two omnibuses Those are great. I that stories in that that obi-wan stories in there that is worth a reread it's a great little short story yeah it's a mm -hmm. lot of fun and it was neat to see you know it's funny uh there's this guys who whose work i love a lot chris schweizer i don't if, if you're on twitter you should follow chris schweizer uh he's just an incredible comic book artist mm -hmm. um and one day uh, we were talking about that Obi-Wan story. Somehow it came up and, and, he, and he made the interesting point of like, he loved how Obi-Wan was presented in Silent Drifting because he's in a completely different uniform. Like he's, like he's in all black. He looks yeah. kind of like Jedi Luke from Return of the Jedi. Um, he's like, why would Obi-Wan hide out in his Jedi outfit? You know, it made, yeah. it, it made no sense, you know? And I thought, what? I never thought about that before. Like he wants to hide out. He doesn't want anyone to know who he is. Mm -hmm. But in the, you know, I think the prequels was the first time we see what the Jedi as a whole looked like, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's revealed that what Obi-Wan was wearing on Tatooine is what Jedi's wear, kind of. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. You know and, uh, and that was an interesting point, I thought. I was like, yeah, you're right. Why would he dress like a, a Jedi when he's hiding out? And so that's another funny thing about silent drifting too is like yeah maybe maybe marvel was uh right on back in the you know 
yes. 70 whatever that issue came out that you know give him this different look as a, as a as an active jedi knight you know yeah and then of course then in return of the jedi luke is all in all black yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm sorry, Matt. I'm gonna we gotta we gotta I'm gonna continue on because I don't want to keep you too long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, I'm I'm trying to derail all your. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. So okay, so um, let's jump into Hellboy, Bones of Giants. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm gonna ask you know what is the story about for our listeners? Uh, how not to give it all away, but well, it's uh, Hellboy is is. The BPRD is is called in to investigate a corpse mm -hmm. that appears to be, would seem to be, you know, the fallen uh, corpse of the god Thor. You know yes. that it, you know. Of course, everyone's thinking this this can't possibly be out of you know this character out of mythology. You know, um, and I don't think this is giving away too much. Right in the beginning. Hellboy picks up the, the hammer of Thor, Mjolnir, to investigate it. He yes. gets struck by lightning, fused to his hand. At that point, Hellboy is semi-possessed by a remnant of Thor that's present within Mjolnir. Uh, sort of, he's, he's, he has access to Thor's memories. He's, he's being driven by the hammer. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried to make that a little bit apparent on the first cover. Uh, and then on the last cover, which has already been revealed, so it's not giving anything away, you see Hellboy more sort of in control of Mjolnir. Um, and so, yeah, I don't want to give too much away. It's a, you know, it's a Norse mythology mm -hmm. based story. It's uh, it's something really bad is going to try to uh, do some terrible things to mankind. Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> the secret to how to deal with that is, uh, you know, is fused to uh, Hellboy's hand, uh, things that he needs to, places he needs to go and things that he needs to do to, to combat what's going on. Yeah, I don't know. I love the story. I bought the book when it came out uh, because I was already a Hellboy fan. I think before we began taping, mm -hmm. I was telling you, and I think is when Wake the Devil came out, I became a big Hellboy fan. Mm -hmm. I was already previously a big Norse mythology fan, again, thanks mm -hmm. to Walt Simonson. So when I saw this book, I was like, oh my God, this is like that. There used to be old ads about uh, Reese's peanut butter cups, about people tripping and falling into each other and the, the chocolate getting mixed in with yes. the peanut butter, you know? Oh. <laughs> you remember that? And uh, so I felt like this this was the Reese's peanut butter cup of Hellboy novel. It was, you know, it was like, oh my God, here's two of my favorite things. Christopher Golden has like beautifully mixed them together. Mm -hmm. uh, so I read it many times, and mm -hmm. then I lent it to my youngest sister, who lost it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, so that's what happened to. Okay, <laughs> that's what happened. To my, I actually told this Chris Golden, and he was like, he was like, oh, I'll have to get you another copy. Um, of course, I could just buy another copy, but I, yeah. I, I love the idea. I'm just gonna wait for him to give me a copy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I read it many times, and uh -huh. uh, and so yeah, I pictured the the story many many times in my head yeah. um, although you'd think that would be a big help and to some degree it was but to some degree too when you read a book it's like fluid like a film you know mm -hmm. and uh putting things down in hard line is such a different animal okay. and so you know it was it was uh yeah it was probably helpful overall but there's times too where it's like you know i'm like oh you know i pictured this this way you know and, uh -huh. and, frustrated with the limitations of you yeah. know locking it down into panels you know mm -hmm. and, and there's you know there's always with an adaption you know there's certain things you know you you're, you're you're you know it's like with a movie adaption of a book or something mm -hmm. you know it's like there's only you know the series would have to be how many issues i don't know to get everything in the book so you have to make choices you know, of what, mm -hmm. what stays yeah. in and you know and i think chris did a really good job with that. I was really amazed when I heard that the book was being, you know, the book is like 300 pages, I think, like it was being turned into four issues. Um, I was wondering how that translation would work. Uh, yeah. And then when I got the scripts, I'm like, oh, okay, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know, he just, you know, kept all the major beats. Um, everything that I remembered from that I wanted to be in the story was in the story. Uh, I felt like the, the atmosphere, uh, that I remembered uh, that I loved that, you know, he managed to keep that. So mm -hmm. 
actually like no small feat. I was really impressed with with how he did that. And so that was that was really fun working on this series was to see how he was going to take mm-hmm. that book mm-hmm. and uh, translate it to an entirely different medium and an entirely different length mm-hmm. and, and keep the spirit of it, which which he did. Um, yeah. And so now I'm just now I just try not to mess it up. That was my job. Chris did an amazing job. He did the him and Mike did an amazing job the first time, uh, and then Chris did an amazing job again mm-hmm. translating himself. And then so I was like, okay, these guys have done work that is incredible. Don't screw it up, Matt. That was my <laughs> that was my, my my mantra to myself. Don't mess it up. <laughs> along, the, along this process line, um, Drew, the co-host of Comics for Fun and Profit, submitted this question. Um, did Christopher give you complete scripts to follow or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, he really, he, he completely, you know, it was, it was all laid out. Uh, okay. You know, he, he's, he's a pretty descriptive writer. Um, yeah, the all credit to that, it goes, goes to Christopher. Uh, I did get the scripts. I don't think I got them all at once. So that was kind of fun too, was, you know, I think I was already, you know, working on script one. Mm-hmm before, you know, before I got script two, you know, so I didn't, I didn't, you know, I knew the story really well, but I didn't know exactly how he was going to adapt it. So it was fun to have to wait, you mm-hmm. know, until the script two would come along and the script, they, they didn't all happen at the same time. So it was like, you know, it's like waiting for your favorite TV show, the next episode to come on. It's like, okay, is he going to put this thing in? Mm-hmm. How is he going to do this? You know, if, if, if this, you know, cool scene is in it, I'll be upset. And of course, then the cool scene would be in it. Uh, you know? So yeah, you know, uh, I shouldn't, you know, of course I shouldn't doubt it. You know, he knows his own story and what makes it great. And so, um, yeah, it was neat. It was neat to see that that process of his, you know, mm-hmm. him, him, him completely. Yeah, yeah, so I got a complete full scripts and uh, all I had to do was just to try to mm-hmm. try to put it down in line. Yeah. Now, I'm going to go a little bit further, just a little bit back. Uh, I'm going to take a step back. Um, how did you get this cool assignment, and how excited were you when you got it? Like, I know there's a story how, how this all came about, right? Yeah. Wow, yeah. Sometimes I wonder how it came about. Well, I told you how I got on Golosky Station. That was, again, that, that just wild luck of Dan leading to Walt, leading to, you know, this is my interpretation anyway. I don't know if, if those guys will have seen it differently, but this is how I saw events playing out, you know, Mike becoming aware of, you know, and then him sending me an email out of the blue one time. I was actually outside raking leaves and, mm-hmm. uh, and I got a message. Now, again, I didn't have a smartphone, but I had a, uh, someone had given me a smartphone I used as a, um, an MP3 player. So I okay, just yeah. music. But if you're in Wi-Fi range, you could, you know, on this thing, because I didn't have cell service, you could, I could still get email messages. Oh, okay. and so I get a message, I'm out there reading leaves, and it's, you know, it says it's from Mike Mignola asking me if I'm interested in a story about a ancient Russian werewolf hunter. And I'm like, this can't be real. This has to be yeah. some friend, you know, <laughs> yes. Frank. I was like, all this stuff sounds way too cool. Um, but it was real. And so that happened. And then... I had afraid, I was afraid I totally screwed that up, Koloski Station. Like, when you work on something you're a big fan of, you know, mm-hmm. you have the highest expectations, you know, and so there's a danger of, when, I, when I'm doing a Hellboy story, I want it to feel like a Hellboy story, like a classic Hellboy story that I would want to read, because I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of it, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, and, and so it's not like I want to ape Mike's style, but I want it to feel like, you know, as a Hellboy reader, if I were to pick it up, I want to feel like it fits within the, you know, the Hellboy yes. universe. It feels like a, a classic Hellboy story. And so I think there's a, there's a danger when you're doing something like that of trying to get it so accurate, like you're like, oh, am I getting his hand right, this big stone hand? Is it, you know, does it feel like Hellboy? You know, you're, you're second guessing yourself all the time, or at least I do. Um, and so that can lead when drawing that can that can lead straight to like a stiffness that mm-hmm. say like you might not have if you were just writing your own story and you were like you know and you would never you know these characters are your characters no one's ever seen them before you're mm-hmm. you're just like okay well this is i'm making this up so whatever 
I decided it looks like is what it looks like. Uh, mm -hmm. And so having it be someone, you know, having it be not only someone else's character and story, but a character that I'm a major fan of and it was a huge influence on me doing comics at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely like, like, ooh, did I get this right? Does this feel like a classic mm -hmm. Hellboy story? And so I was worried that it was too stiff or something initially. Like, my, you know, if I'm being completely honest, honest I thought, oh boy, you know, this should have been a hundred times better. Mm -hmm. And so when I met Mike at Boston Comic-Con, he kindly reached out and said, oh, I'm going to be, this is after Glossky Station. He said, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be at Boston Comic-Con. Maybe we could get lunch. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, I mean, I was, I was very happy that, you know, he wanted to meet, but I was also really nervous because yeah. of, I just didn't know how he felt about how Glossky Station came off. So I showed up there expecting, you know, like, I don't know what I expected, but I was, I was, I was kind of worried. And so, and then over that lunch, he starts talking about Bones of Giants, you know, uh -huh. which already I'm a huge fan of the book and saying, do you want to, you know, would you have any interest? And so it was this weird scenario where, I mean, I was overjoyed, but I, like I was in two brains. I was like trying to be professional. Yes. Talk to Mike Mignola, like a person who could, you know, yes. work with him. But in the same, <laughs> at the same time, my other brain was like, is this, ha is this conversation happening? <laughs> you know? So, uh, so yeah, so yeah, no, I was, temp I was completely overjoyed. You know, of course I, I left that lunch and immediately called my wife and, you know, was on cloud nine about that. Um, so yeah, you know, that's how that came about. And yeah, I, I could try to play it cool and say, oh yeah, it was great, you know, but you know, I was completely, you know, and over the moon. Yeah. And especially for Mike to go, hey, he's like asking you directly. It's not like from Dark Horse, an uh, editor from Dark Horse going, would you be interested in doing this assignment? It's coming directly from Mike. That is so awesome. Yeah, it was, it was, it was something else. I mean, he was so warm and inviting to, you know, just such a nice guy. Mm -hmm. You know, you just... I mean, I'd had brief interactions with him, like with Glosky Station. I think we had one phone call and, a, mm -hmm. and some emails, and he was very nice. Uh, and but you know, anytime you meet someone who's like an artistic inspiration, you know, uh, huge mm -hmm. inspiration, and someone you're a fan of, it's always a little nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, even if all your previous interactions have been nothing but nice, it's just uh -huh. it's, it's always going to be a little intimidating. But uh, yeah, he was nothing but warm and inviting and uh that's really and nice. so yeah there you go that's how that came about i'm gonna i'm jokingly asking this question so when like you said you had two brains where the person you know you're the adult the professional side trying uh, you're going oh my god this is happening i'm gonna i'm jokingly ask did the eight the eight year or the ten year old Matt go? Oh my God! You know, like you wanted to get up and run around the restaurant. Oh, Mike, sure. <laughs> you know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. I mean, luckily yeah. we, we each had a beer, uh, and so that helped <laughs> help take the edge off. I think you know that that, that that helped keep the appearance of being somewhat cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now. <laughs> Um, now I I know you mentioned, and it's unfortunate that your sister lost your your um not the the now the the uh, yeah yeah girl. Now. now have you read any of the other Hellboy novels? Sure, I read the uh, Lost Army. Oh God, um, that might be it actually. That's mm -hmm. kind of I have, I have to admit it. I think I read the Lost Army and Bones of Giants. So these are two. Was, think, yeah, because from my research, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I think they're only. Two by Christopher Gordon, I think. I feel like there's a third, and now I feel super bad because I should know. Um, but uh, I really enjoyed Lost Army. I thought it was a lot of fun, but there was just no comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I just yeah again I was just I'm just I was preloaded with a love for Norse mythology. And yeah. I think Christopher said himself that like he feels that's the better written of those two. Mm -hmm. But that you know. I wasn't even comparing them on writing quality. I just thought they were both a lot of fun, but just because I'm predisposed to, you know, if you've got Thor and you've got mm -hmm. Valkyries and that kind of thing and Norman Gander and all this stuff in it, then I'm, I'm just going to love it, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Now, you know, um, I'm going to ask, uh, and, and if you don't know, that's fine too, but I'm just asking, are there any plans to adapt the other, you know, the, um, the Lost Army into a limited comic series? I know, I, I'm not going to say no, because I don't know, but I haven't, I haven't been part of those conversations, you know. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised. It seems like a, you know, a, a great idea, but, uh, yeah. but no one's asked me. No. <laughs> Now, no spoilers. Yes. You have a Hellboy, Hellboy story of your own that you want to write and draw. Oh, did, did I tell you about this? Is this? No. Or are you asking me? I'm oh, asking yeah, you. No, I, 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 I wrote a Hellboy story. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know if I'll ever see the light of day. It's really kind of a strange story because when Mike first asked me if I would be interested in Glosky Station. Yes. I, you know, I should have just sketched Hellboy. You know, that would be the easiest way to get prepared. But for some reason, I decided I was going to write a short story and sketch it out so that I would be drawing Hellboy uh, close up, his face. I'd be drawing him far away. Because that's something that I'm always amazed at with Mignola is the way he reduces things when you just have the necessary details so that, you, you know, they're just beautifully designed panels. Mm -hmm. And again, I didn't want to ape him completely, but I just yeah. wanted to sort of go through the paces of, of working on Hellboy in a bunch of different scenarios. I think because I felt like if I was just gonna sketch Hellboy over and over again to try to get him down, I'd probably end up drawing him at the same size and the same kind of, you know, it's sometimes you just fall into ruts and you draw the same position and the same mm -hmm. size. But I was like, I'm gonna write a little short story and I'm gonna, you know, cause I think when he first offered it to me, it was like, it's gonna be a ways off. He's like, he just wanted to gauge interest, but it wasn't like I was handed a script the day that he, he called. So I had time to think about like, oh my God, I'm going to be doing mm -hmm. a Hellboy story. Uh, you know, I should, I've read him a bunch of times, but I should probably see if I can, you know, draw him okay. And so, yeah, I, I wrote a short story um, as practice, a strange way, I guess, to go about practicing. But then I sent Mike some of the pages just for fun. And, uh, and he seemed to, to think they were neat. Uh, it's not entirely impossible that I'll flesh it out someday, but uh, it's, 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 it's all written. It's pretty much all sketched. I just need to make time to, to do the final art. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know if it, uh, there'll ever be an opportunity to put it out there, but yeah, there, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't want to, it's, it's, I'll tell, I'll say this, it's set in Iceland. I, I took Hellboy to Iceland. And okay. <laughs> I went to Iceland in like 2016. I met a really cool guy who mm -hmm. works at uh, the only comic book shop in Reykjavik. Um, wow. I met him, and uh, so I put him and his family into the story. Oh, that's pretty uh, cool. <laughs> and then some great Icelandic folklore, of course, you know, yes. worked into it. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like a lot of, like most comic book, you know, any artist I know, I'm, I'm pretty critical of my own work. I can love someone else's mm -hmm. and then and sometimes I've actually thought about at conventions, I was like, let's just switch tables because I hate talking up my own work or, you know, but, but I could talk up my friend's work all day long. It's like, look at this thing. This thing's amazing. And uh, so I was like, let's just switch tables. I can talk about your work all day long and I won't feel, you know, awkward about talking about my own. So, but anyway, I revisited that story recently. I just thumbed through the, 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 the pages I had done and, and I still like it. Mm -hmm. So, that's a good sign for me that I that I, I don't immediately say like oh god <laughs> you know and so uh, so yeah I don't know I don't know if I see the light of day it's not very long it's like twelve for thirteen pages I don't know uh, it's a holiday story so oh, you know okay. I, I don't think it'd be the worst fit for a, 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 a you know a holiday issue yeah uh, but uh, yeah there you go that's so th there is a there is a story that's out there it's just well it's not out there yet but it's in progress but but the thing is you have it set in case you get a call from somebody yeah in case <laughs> ever, yeah 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 like in 2000 like in like the summer like maybe uh, i'm just i'm 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 just making this up like in the in the spring of 2023 a dark horse editor goes, "Hey, Matt, you know we're gonna pull out a Christmas thing on Hellboy. Yeah, yeah. Release and you got something, you know? <laughs> I can say yes. <laughs> it's it's almost done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
All right, so Matt, I'm slowly wrapping this up. One yeah. last question about the um, Hellboy. Do you have any of the Hellboy action figures or statues? I have uh, the, what is it? 10,000, 1,000 toys? What's that? Uh, it's one of the more recent ones. It's, oh, here, I'll show it. I have it somewhere here. I keep it, I bought it because, here it is. Again, this is something that people listening won't be able to see. Oh, oh. But this one. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Oh my God, wait a minute. It's the, it, he's holding Mjolnir. Yeah, yeah, I got, I, I got a, a little Mjolnir to put in his hand because, you know, in celebration of. <laughs> so cool. But I actually bought him as a, as a drawing aid because I thought like, you know, yes. his stone hand and all these different positions, you know, if I ever ran into trouble, I could just hold that toy in my hand and yes. rotate it around and say, you know, oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, again, that's something I don't want to do all the time because it's that stiffness thing again. If you try to get something too right sometimes, it, it really, you know, it can affect the, uh, but there, there were occasions where it was an angle and I'm like, ah, you know, it looks totally wrong the way I'm drawing it. Mm -hmm. This is the great thing. It could look totally wrong. And then you could hold the toy and look at it and say, mm -hmm. oh no, that, that actually is what it looks like at that angle, you know? So it's, it's uh, yeah. So I buy a lot of toys just to have around. Mm -hmm. But that one I could at least pretend to have yes. a, a professional reason mm -hmm. <laughs> for getting them. Now, actually, this is an off-the-cuff question. Last question about Hellboy. Have you ever, at any of the conventions, have, and I don't know if Ron, I don't know if Ron Perlman ever does conventions. Have you ever met him? No. Or, and then correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sorry, what was that again? No, no, I've never met Ron Perlman. Okay. Yeah. And then was it, was it David Har Harbour who recently? Yes. Did, yeah. Have you met him at one? I know no. he's done. Oh, okay. No, I, I think like, like I haven't done many conventions at all. Uh, I do. There's a, there's a couple smaller ones in Massachusetts that are really great. Actually, this one called Mice, which is fantastic. Um, but the, the, the bigger ones where you would have uh, people from films and TV yeah. shows, I've, I mean, Rhode Island Comic Con might be the only one I've done. No, I did a Boston Comic Con when Barbarian Lord came out, and that was 2015 or something. Mm -hmm. um, I've gone to them, yes. but I haven't ever tabled at one, really. Oh, okay. Um, and so my exposure to, uh, you know, that kind of environment where you have these film and, uh, mm -hmm. and television characters around it, like that's, I haven't had a lot of that. Although this, the Rhode Island Comic Con I went to, the guy who organized it knew that I was a huge, I'm a huge Iron Maiden fan since I was young. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, Derek Riggs, the man who painted all the original covers, you know, yes. all the number of the beast and all the, he was there at Rhode Island Comic Con. And so this, this organizer was so kindly uh, placed me to, directly next to Derek Riggs so I could chat with him. And, uh, and so that was, you know, that was, that was again a moment where, I had the two brains going. I'm talking to Derek Riggs and, you know, asking about how he went about painting those seminal covers. And then at the same time, my like 13 year old brain is just, oh my God, you know. Yes. And so, uh, uh, I actually bought a, a little uh, original uh, Eddie drawing from him. So now I have that hung up. Um, that's so that's, yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> that <is laughs> no David Harbour or Ron Perlman, but I met Derek Riggs. So, you know, that's all right. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, I'm slowly wrapping this up. So now, listeners, we are going to go into a little bit of Star Wars. Now, <laughs> Matt, I saw your tweet that you posted on November 30th. I, yeah, I saw yeah. on one of your shelves that you had some original Star Wars action figures. Um, one of them was an original do-back. And to listen to some of our new listeners, those the do-backs are those huge lizards that the sand troopers are riding on in Star Wars. And it's better seen in Star Wars, the special edition um, you know, movies. So um, we talked about, you know, I know you said that the, how you got that, uh, that do back, that nice, that very, very good condition do back. Yeah, just given to me by Dan Larson at uh, Toy Galaxy, I believe. Yeah, I just, he just, I just talking about how much I love the do back and he just sent me one. I couldn't believe it. That is so amazing. That is so amazing. Now, I'm going to ask, do you have any of your original figures? No. 
Oh, no, it kills me. I, I, I gave a bunch away mm -hmm. when I left my, the, the childhood house. I grew up in Haverhill. Mm -hmm. um, I had one, I think I had a hammerhead for the longest time. Yeah. He made it, he made it the longest. I think I held onto one and then he, you know, who knows where these things go? Yeah. You, know, you have so many different apartments or this, you know. Uh -huh. uh, so now, no. I, I have a, 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 a small run. I, it's not huge, but I, you yeah. know, I have the major players. I have Luke and Ben. C3 mm -hmm. and Actually, you can't see them now. They're up on my wall, but I have five Tuscan Raiders because they're my favorite. Oh, yes. Um, and uh, two Dubacks uh, yeah. now. Um, a couple Stormtroopers and uh, a couple Jabba. Mm -hmm. but they, they those have all been in the last few years and apparently i i came into re-getting things at the worst possible time for some reason the the prices have just gone skyrocketed yes. um i didn't even know because of course i hadn't been looking before but when i read on forums now just mm -hmm. people talking about how the huge uptick in the cost of the, the old kind of toys for yeah. who knows <laughs> why maybe it's the disney shows something has reignited interest in mm -hmm. You know, I don't think the interest was ever lost. I think people have been collecting them all along, but yeah, I think maybe there's more general interest or something. I don't know, but um, maybe younger kids think they're cool. You know, it's funny. I had I had a set that wasn't my childhood set that I had gotten maybe in the early '90s or something. I had a full set of all the original figures uh, that I bought off someone for nothing. They just, yeah. they, they, you know, I think at the time no one really cared. Yeah. This was like uh, pre, you know prequels and all that and I gave them to a friend's son a few years ago and I was so glad to see that he was excited because I gave them to him because I thought like what am I doing with these things mm -hmm. they're just yeah. of course now I have them again but uh but I thought what am I doing with these things I'm gonna you know my friend's son is like he's into Star Wars he likes mm -hmm. toys I'm gonna give them to him but part of me expected him to see the you know the old style with like limited mm -hmm. articulation and be like what is this but he was like, oh, the classic's cool. You know, so I was actually pretty excited that uh, he was into them, you know, that he, you know, so I wonder if there's some of that going on, where there's like a, there's a coolness to the old toys that, that people are picking up on, I don't know. I mean, certainly there's companies out there like Super 7 creating new toys in that style. Like, I don't know if you've seen that company, you know, they're creating like- oh, I haven't known. Oh man, Super 7, they, you know, they'll, they, they're all over the place. They've uh -huh. done like, Armies of Darkness, you know, the Bruce Campbell film. Oh my uh, God, yeah. Oh God, they have so many lines, but they all look like that classic Kenner Star Wars, you know, even the card art and everything, it has mm -hmm. that same aesthetic. So, you know, maybe that's part of it. Maybe there's just a, a certain appeal to this, you know, this mm -hmm. sort of uh, old school style toy design. I don't know. Okay, so I know earlier we talked up, you showed you showed me like uh, a black series figure of like the body of Luke and you put um, the head of a, like a, you oh, okay. were oh, that one. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm going to ask, did you see the HasLab black series ranker figure for the six inch action figures on? Yes. Yeah, it looks massive. Uh, I haven't really followed it, but I, I followed it enough to know that there's a whole lot of, uh, grumbling about uh you know did it come with the figures that people wanted it to come with or you know to, it's 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 funny it's just interesting to me because us being again of a similar age yes um you know you never had any input into this kind of stuff it just things came out and you bought it you know but there's there's a and i'm not saying it's a bad thing but there's more of like a back and forth discussion now like with a lot of things thanks yeah. to the internet you know so it's it just is just a different world. Like it would never have occurred yes. to me back in the day to see the original Rancor come out or something and say, oh, you know what, that paint application is terrible or, uh -huh. you know, or it doesn't come with the guy I wanted. The, or the, the, the keeper, the, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm not discrediting people, you know, they, you know, you want what you want or whatever, you know, but it's just, it's just interesting. It's a different, it's obviously a different world, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and HasLab is a different model. You know, the fact that you're relying on people to pre-order for it to go into production in the first place, it's, it's, it's interesting, but yeah, I don't know. I know there's a lot of uproar about it, and, you know, and then it, I, I guess it's not even sure that it'll be produced at this point. Like the, oh, I didn't know about that. 
Well, I, I, that's what I heard with this grumbling about, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the tears, the extra tears, whatever they call it. Yeah. You, get, you get more things, the more orders they get. I guess those were disappointing. People wanted specific characters to come out with it and, and mm -hmm. they didn't, they, well, they didn't give, give them the keeper, which I get, you know, like what other character besides Luke is yeah. you know, more closely associated with the Rancor, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, but where was I going with this? Oh yeah, but, but apparently once those uh, bonus tiers were revealed, all sorts of people canceled their order. So instead of it getting closer to the target goal, it was actually uh -huh. moving away from it, which, you know, uh, so it was, yeah, it's, it's a different world. It <laughs> is. <laughs> There's something, you know, I have to, this will sound terrible. I'll sound like a really regressive character, but there is something I love. I do love about that. This sort of old style of like, you know, you have no input. This is what Kenner is giving you. <laughs> you know, don't get too worked up about it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's fun. It's, yeah. It's because when we were growing up, you know, Luke Skywalker had that telescopic lightsaber. Yeah. And I remember when I bought it, I was like, oh, I wanted to him have it coated in his hand, but that's all we had, and we played yeah. with it. You, know? you loved it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, and for people to complain about the Black Series Rancor now, God, man, remember when Return of the Jedi came out? All it was, the Rancor, I think it was like, you only can move the arm up and down, yeah. turn at the wrist. Yeah, that's right. Um, Which is a pretty big deal. I don't think anything else could turn his wrist from the Yeah, side. yeah. <laughs> but it was just, but the thing was, it was so cool. It looked so cool to get, just to have in the collection. <laughs> well, I guess the difference I did, you know, I guess a big difference, you know, and it's a pretty big difference is that I think this Rancor is going for $350, I think. You know, so that's that's for adult collector. You know, I don't know any kid who has $350, you know, so you're an adult collector. You know, it's a high price item, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to expect certain things. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm not, you know, huge on the Rancor. If they did a Black Series Bantha, oh I would my God. all over that. I think that the Bantha is, you know, I love the Dubak, but if I had to name a single character in the Star Wars universe that's my favorite, it'd be the Tuscan Raider. Yes. If I had to name a creature, it would be the Bantha. You know, those two, like that to me, something about the Tuscan Raiders and the Banthas is like the coolest visuals in yes. you know, the entire Star Wars saga. You know, I just, I just love it. In fact, there was a, I, you know, I don't want to drag this out, but there was just a uh, bottleneck gallery, which is a, like a print, a print company or something. You know, they, they release okay. prints of different things and they've done different Star Wars runs and Marvel stuff, I think, mm -hmm. and all that. This past, what was it, Monday or something, they had a Bantha print and the Star Wars stuff just goes. There's been times I've tried to get a print from Bottleneck and I'm there at 12 noon when it's supposed to go on sale. As my finger descends to hit yeah. the buy button, it's gone. Like, 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 I don't know how it happens, yeah. but somehow, you know, 200, 500 copies of this poster sell out before I can even get this thing in my cart. And so, so I missed out on the band. <laughs> And so now, if I want them now, I'm going to find them on like eBay for like three times what it went for originally, you know. Okay, so off the cuff question. Yeah. If HasLab does a Bantha, you know, a, you know the, the huge Bantha thing with yeah. the Tuscan Raider, would you go for it? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm in. Yeah, I would, yeah. I'll sell teeth, whatever I have to do. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm sure I have some organs that aren't doing much. <laughs> I'll just get rid of those. No, yeah, there was a big band that I'd be, I'd be into it. Uh, you know, I should probably get, make a go of making one or something. I've seen some online that are really good. I've seen some people like, you know, uh, I don't know what they did, but, uh, you know, because the, the, the Black Series um, Tuscan Raider is great. You know, the one they released, you know, he is amazing. Uh, so, you know, we need a band to go with that guy. Yes. Okay. So, again, no spoilers. Do you have a Star Wars story ready to go or an idea if Dark Horse calls you? Because I know. Yeah, that's funny, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's funny that you mentioned it because, uh, yeah, I wrote one of those too. Uh, at one point, I was talking to uh, Tom Snagowski, who wrote the um, Young Hellboy series that my friend Craig Russo drew. And, uh, and again, it's a small world where Tom, Craig, Chris Gold and I all live in Massachusetts. We've all gotten together. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And Tom and I got in a conversation one point. We're, there's something I can't talk about yet, but we just did a short story together that's for not Hellboy related, but another character that I'm a huge fan of. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at some point, I don't know, somehow he brought up Star Wars. I'm like, write me a Star Wars story, Tom, because I need, you know, since I was five years old, I, I need a Star Wars story. Yeah. So, so, you know, I think he just thought I was kidding around. But so I was just like, I wrote up my brief ideas, like do something with this. Yes. And I sent him this story and then he was like, yeah, you should just flesh that thing out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did a little bit. And so, yeah, I don't know, you know, it was one of these things again, where it was just an exercise for fun. Yeah. I didn't, you know, uh, I'm not gonna, I don't know. I can't imagine ever working in the Star Wars world, but if it were to happen, you know, if someone were to ask, yeah, yes, yeah. I, I got I got a Star Wars story ready to go. It's very light. It's very, uh, it fits within a, uh, it fits within a sequence in the first movie. Uh huh. Um, it's it's not very heavy duty, but it fits yeah. in all my favorite stuff. I got you know, gets in the Dubak, gets in the Bantha, gets uh -huh. in the Tuscan Raiders. <laughs> so yeah. you know, that'll probably never happen, but I've worked it out anyway. But at least you're ready. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to ask, have you and your family been to Hawaii? No. Uh, no, I would love to. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I hope this doesn't sound weird, but like Hawaii is one of those places, until I went to Iceland, it was like Hawaii and, and places like Iceland for me are they're like mythological in some sort of sense. You know, it's like, it's, mm -hmm. I know people. I know I'm talking to you. You're there. You live there. You yeah. know, lots of people do. Uh, I grew up knowing it was a state, you know. Uh, but I think because I've only ever experienced it through fiction, mm -hmm. you know, the first one would have been, uh, what was it, the Brady Bunch? Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And, you know, and then it's, you know, it's the folklore, you know, which I don't know a, a whole lot about, mm -hmm. but I know, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, what do they call it? polytheistic, multiple gods, you know, animalistic mm -hmm. stuff, you know, it's, it's stuff I've approached through, again, like Iceland, but I've approached it through the sort of lens of stories, mm -hmm. mythology, yes. you know, uh, and so you know it's a real place, but until you go there, it was like Iceland, you know, until I went there, for me, that was all like the Icelandic sagas and elves and this and that, you know, and then you go there and you're like, oh, you know, you meet people and they live and work there. And I almost still can't believe it. Like uh, that friend I met in Iceland, I can't believe he just, just gets to live there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when we do Zoom calls like this, sometimes he'll like open his window and be like, hey, look, you know, there's, there's Reykjavik outside, you know, it's like, wow, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's always a place that like is... Uh, I've only been once, but it was a thrill to visit, and I can't wait to go back. And Hawaii is in that kind of same, like, it's like, people get to just be there all the time? Because for me, it would be like, a, you know, it would be visiting somewhere that I visited only in, you know, fictional stories and presented as part of, you know, uh, you know, as, you know, well, it's part of the story. So yeah, I don't. That's a weird answer, but that's you know, I've never been. And it's 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 hard to imagine. Not hard to imagine going, but it's like it's like a again a place that's steeped in yeah fictional yeah. stories. You know, and I don't know it through the lens of day to day. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. <laughs> All right. Oh uh, <laughs> no, because I because the only thing I only I because we have conventions here. Yeah. And you know, um I d I don't know any of the you know, I don't know the organizers on Oahu, you know, the ones that are on Oahu, but I'm hoping if an organizer comes across this interview, hopefully, you know, they invite you know, they invite you to come down. You oh, know, that'd be amazing. That'd be, yeah. yeah. You know. That'd be something. Yeah, <laughs> and then we'd have to get together, you know. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'll I'll bring you one of my two do bags. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, Matt. So, last question: Any closing words to our listeners? <laughs> uh boy. Uh, yeah. I mean, I hope if you check out Bones of Giants, you enjoy it. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Here's one of these things I should have thought of beforehand. No. But. Or let me actually 
there was one question I forgot to ask you, and maybe this is a good closure for, you know, I'll be honest, like I've mentioned that, you know, um, I probably read one or two Hellboy comics, like from yeah. Dark Horse, those dollar ones. What would you recommend to new readers or longtime readers that always want to get into Hellboy, but never got into it because there's so much. Yeah, it's a big world. It's, yeah, it's like anything, like where it's, you, you approach it now after X amount of years of it being out, it's a big world and where you start. And it's funny you bring this up uh, because there's that uh, friend of mine who asked me the other day about, you know, I want to turn my nephew onto Hellboy. Um, and he doesn't know a lot about comics. I send him the stuff I draw uh, just because we're friends. And so he's like, he, he likes what he sees of Hellboy. He wants to turn his nephew on. And so I thought, well, you could start with Seed of Destruction, which is the beginning of the whole story, really. Mm -hmm. But then my second thought was, you know, one of the short story collections that are so fun, mm -hmm. you get a sense of the character that Hellboy is, which is this character of two worlds. You know, he's born this, with the supernatural element, he's got this destiny and all that, but he was raised by a human, you know, man or a human mm -hmm. family, you know, different people around. Um, you know, so he's got, he's got a, a, a foot in two worlds. And so how he approaches things is, is unique to the series, which is what I love about it. He's mm -hmm. just, you know, um, so you read one of these short story collections, like say uh, The Chain Coffin and other stories, you're gonna get a sense of who the character is, but you're also gonna get these shorter forays into different types of mythology. Uh, and Chain Coffin, I think is where there's a fantastic werewolf story, which is one of the shorter story, which is one of the longest of the short stories. Mm -hmm. um, you get the first, I think it's the first Hellboy story ever, The Corpse, which is one of my favorites and everyone's favorites, yes, yeah. uh, Hellboy short stories. So. Like I'd recommend that, although it's hard for me because I want to recommend the Chain Coffin for those reasons, for the Corpse and for the Wolves of St. August, and there's other great stuff in there. But the Red Right Hand of Doom is my favorite Hellboy short story of all time, which is King mm -hmm. Vol, which is where uh, really the Bones of Giants, I think, springs from, or at least there's a character in King Vol who plays a major role in Bones of Giants. And so uh, being a fan of Norse mythology, the first time I read that, I was like, oh my God, this is my favorite, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Hellboy short story. Um, so I, I don't think you'd go wrong with either one, but I would almost recommend pick up one of the short story collections. You won't be lost without mm -hmm. any background. Everything you need to know to enjoy the character is there. His personality, the humor of it, the coolness of the different types of mythology that he gets involved in. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's going to make you want to know the whole story. And then you're going to want to go back to Seed of Destruction. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, again, to use another analogy, it's, you know, like X-Files, you're, I wouldn't start someone on episode one or, you know, yeah. I'd be like, here's this great monster of the week episode. That's so much fun, mm -hmm. here's this, you know, and then, and then if the person was like, okay, I love the X-Files. Now you start back with, you know, episode one, you get the big, you know, alien conspiracy storyline and then all the fun stories in between. And Hellboy is the same way. You get the big destiny of Hellboy and what will he do? Mm -hmm. uh, you have all these wild, fun things that happen along the way. You have the, you have the, you know, these shorter, you know, stories and you have the big, mm -hmm. you know, destiny story and this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I guess I'd hook them with the, with the fun, you know, some of these fun shorter stories and then, you know, anyone, once they read those, they're going to, they want, you're going to want to dig into the bigger story. All right, Matt, you know, thank you very much. Thank you for those recommendations. Matt, I want to wish you all the success with Hellboy, um, Bones of Giant, the limited series. Thank you. you know, so I wish you all the success on that. I'm going to let the listeners know I read the first two issues. I love it. I love your art style. Thanks so much. You know, it, um, you, you know, um, you know, um, because I, you know, it's, I can see, you know, the touches of um, Mike Mignola's um, work on, you know, your, you know, your, your homage or, you know, to uh, Mike's work in, in these two episodes, in these two issues, but yet it's still your own, it's still your own work. Oh, and thanks so much. World, you know, I, I love it, you know, so. I think it, like this is not meant to be a pitch because I don't I just don't like being pitchy. Uh, but uh, 
things really ramp up, you know, in the, I, I really enjoy what, what's happened so far, but, mm -hmm. but things get, uh, things get a bit nutty <laughs> in the, in the in last couple three, of months. Right? <laughs> what's that, sorry? In, in issue three, things start ramping yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Thing, yeah. Like, big things start to happen. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think if you enjoy the first two, you're really going to enjoy the, the second half of it. Because sure. I'm not going to give anything away because when I read issue two, when I got to the end, I was like, I can't believe you guys cut it at this part, <laughs> but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Understand. You know, I don't, I'm not going to give too much away, but I, I, it's a, it's a fun story. It's okay. just really fun where, where it goes. Yeah. All right. And, you know, and mahalo. Thank you in Hawaiian. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Literally your generosity of your time. Um, listeners, I told Matt, we we're just only going to be an hour. You know, we've, of course, obviously gone more than an hour. So Matt, just thank you very much for your time. Thank sure. You. I hope I wasn't too wordy and going off road all the time. <laughs> no, but it was great because, you know, we talked, because the, the we talked about the th two things that you really love, you know, Hellboy and the Norse mythology, Walt Simonson. Yeah, you know, yeah. Talked about Star Wars. So that was. Yeah, I could talk about those things for hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, thank you very much. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, interview you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me on. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. And then Great. I also, and then again, I just want to. Give a big shout out to David and Hannah Superfan Promotions. Th uh, David, thank you very much for helping set up this interview. Thank you very much. You know, um, if you are a new if you are a new reader to comics or a lifelong reader, please check out Hellboy, Bones of Giants limited series. Or as Matt had mentioned, um, his recommendations um, of the um, I'm trying to the um, the Chain of Coffin um, and other short stories. Is that correct? Is yeah, one of them? Chain of Coffin. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fine introduction. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then um, and and also you know um, Hellboy, Bones of Giants. The first two issues are out in stores right now. Issue three will come out on January fifth, two thousand twenty-two. And the previous code for that is N O V two one zero two eight six. I want to thank Drew, the co-host of Comics for Fun and Profit, for putting this episode together. Drew, thank you very much for all your hard work behind the scenes. And if you are a new listener, please check out new episodes of Comics for Fun and Profit that comes out every Saturday. And I want to thank you, the listeners. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening to this episode. Until next time, guys. Aloha.